1966 in Detroit, Ben Carson is a primary student. All his classmates receive excellent grades on their class assessments, but Ben consistently receives a zero, making him the laughingstock of his peers. On his class spelling test he once again receives the lowest of the class while other students score above 20. He scores none, but the teacher of the class overhears it and appears to be happy with Ben's poor score when she thinks that it's 9. To the teacher this is quite an improvement by Ben's standards. The class laughs loudly at Ben, they think he is the most dumb and stupid person ever. Benjamin, how many did you get right? Nine. I think he did it. Hey girl, he's the dumbest kid in the world. And Ben starts believing so too. Ben is followed everywhere, not because he is celebrated, but rather for the incorrect motive. People make fun of him every time they see him. One day after being made fun of by his classmates, Benny lashes out by punching one of the kids in the head, which leads to his mother being summoned to the school where she was warned of his behavior. The young mother is not less alarmed when he also shows her son's report card. Ben struggles with practically every subject. He claims to his mother that he is incapable of improving since he is stupid, but she is a source of inspiration, and she disagrees, she never stops inspiring him, telling him that he is a smart boy who is capable of so much more, and he too can accomplish great things. She believes he can accomplish the unthinkable, despite being repeatedly made fun of and subjected to racial harassment by his peers. Too, I know you can. I'm dumb, mother. No, you ain't. You a smart boy. You just ain't using that smartness. Ben once asked his mom for assistance while reading. She completely avoids the matter by claiming that she needs a new pair of reading glasses because she is embarrassed about her own education. She then learns that Ben has an eye condition that prevents him from reading because he cannot properly focus on the small print. So, she bought him some reading glasses. As soon as he receives his spectacles, he starts doing better on his assignments, quizzes, and spelling competition. Ben goes to church on Sundays to hear the sermon. In his speech, the minister tells the tale of a missionary doctor who treated patients, despite receiving death threats from the king, the story moved Ben and he decides to pursue his dream of being a missionary doctor, he begins to picture himself in that role as the idea has opened the door to an entirely new universe of learning and development for him. He returns home and tells his mother that he wants to become a doctor. Ben's belief that he is not smart is now given way to confidence. He discovers a brand new perspective on life. However, his mother is not as pleased because Ben and his brother Curtis watch television frequently. She goes to a mental hospital because she is depressed. She discusses her concern and fear with the doctor. She shares that she was unable to attend school and married at the young age of 13. She then learns that her husband has a second wife and a child. She stays married because she was worried about how her boys would be raised, she later also learns that her husband was a drug dealer. She leaves the marriage and raises her sons alone, her life is challenging, in order to support her family, she works as a cleaner. However, she keeps that information as a secret from her kids. Her mental health suffers greatly as a result, and she develops depression as a result of her overwhelming worry and anxiety, she discloses her suicide intentions to the doctor, who advises that she check herself in for a few days. Despite her worries, she makes the same choice, she reveals her travel to Detroit to Curtis and Ben. She surrenders custody of them to an elderly woman, the boy's object when she asks them to remember the timetables while she is away. When she arrives at the hospital among her stuff, she discovers a letter from Ben it is full of grammatical errors but is yet extremely emotional, and when she sees the letter, she becomes emotional. Ben's academic progress is ongoing, he now scores 24 out of 25 on a test for the class. He dashes home to inform their carer, to his amazement, he discovers that his mother has returned, he gives her a hug, updates her on his development, and displays his grades, she is obviously ecstatic and proud. She never stops inspiring Ben, and he keeps becoming better. In the interim, she secures cleaning duties at the home of a wise and sympathetic individual. She is astounded to find a sizable room filled with various books, when she gets home, she finds her boys watching TV. She turned it off and ordered the boys to visit the library every week to read two books and write a report on each of them. She also states that the boys are only permitted to watch two TV shows per week after doing their homework. Although the boys appear frustrated, they obey their mother, they establish their reading habits by enrolling in a library. They also begin their educational journey on TV, to enlarge their horizons, they watch quiz shows, the dividends from Ben's newfound love of studying begin to flow immediately. In class the teacher selects a rock and asks the students if they are familiar with it, everyone except a skeptic Ben, doesn't know. The rock, according to him, is obsidian. He continues by outlining how obsidian is formed, Ben's level of knowledge astounded the teacher, he requests a meeting with Ben after class. When Ben runs into him after class, 
the teacher tells him that he has unleashed the power of his mind. This is a big statement, especially coming from your teacher the whole time Ben performs admirably in his class. His spelling is impeccable, the class teacher is unhappy, but she is powerless to stop the announcement of Ben as the victor after he wins the spelling competition in his class. She displays her racism at the yearly award ceremony later when the principal of the school declares Ben to be the top student overall. In the audience are his mother and brother, they exhibit the same levels of pride as Ben when he accepts his certificate. However, a racist teacher steps up to the microphone and says something that reveals her pervasive racism. She claims that even though Ben is a black kid and was raised by a low-income single mother, they were unable to outperform him, and the other students should be ashamed of themselves. Sadly, she was unable to appreciate Ben's skills through the lens of her- Before Benjamin takes a seat, I have a few words I want to say. Benjamin is a boy of color. He has no father in his life. He comes to us with tremendous disadvantages. There's no reason you shouldn't have done better than him. What's wrong with you kids? You're not trying hard enough. You should be ashamed. Due to this occurrence, his mother used her savings to move her sons to Chicago. Now, at his new high school, Ben is once again the target of jeers because of his own attire. The following day at school, Carl, a bully, is intimidated by Ben's courage and ends up becoming his friend. Ben asked his mother for money so he can buy some new clothes despite having little, his mother unwillingly finds some money and buys him a new pair of pants. Ben dislikes the worn out looking pants he got. He argues with his mother about wanting to wear trendy clothing like his friend, but his mother disapproves of that and claims that those who wear high fashion are internally deceived. During the disagreement, Ben becomes enraged, he grabs the hammer his mother was using to repair the window and charges at her. He is saved by his brother who intervene, he then storms off to his unwise friends hook him to a gang where he purchased a knife. He is insulted by his friend during a disagreement in both of their lucks, Ben stabs him with the knife but he knife shattered and nothing bad happened. Ben fled home from school in terror he prayed, this was a blessing in disguise, he then left that unhealthy friendship. In addition, he becomes aware of the negative consequences of rage and develops the ability to manage it. He receives a scholarship that allows him admission to Yale, where he meets his girlfriend, Candy. He has a really difficult time adjusting to life at Yale, he admits to Candy that his only strength is reading and he dislikes the lectures, and he doesn't feel like going to class but he is concerned about his studies in future. Candy assists him, she claims that he can study independently, both during the day and night. Of all the subjects Ben is mostly bothered by chemistry, he studies so hard that he starts to hallucinate, in which the chemistry professor appears to be writing the formula down on the board for him. His diligent study pays off as he performs admirably on the exam and decides to pursue a career in neurosurgery. The most prestigious university in the US, Johns Hopkins, receives his application, only two resident students for the neurosurgery facility were accepted by Johns Hopkins, and only the top pupils can get a chance there due to the fierce competition. Ben is adamant that he will only apply there and there alone in order to be allowed. He attends a meeting, when the doctor inquires as to his motivation for becoming a neurological surgeon, he exudes confidence. Ben responds that he wants to solve the mysteries surrounding the brain because it is a mysterious organ. He claims to believe in the possibility of miracles and expresses a desire to perform them. His interviewer is impressed by his confidence, and he is admitted and continues to succeed at Johns Hopkins. According to a prominent physician, people don't like you and you are not exceptional as he addresses Ben, now, Dr. Carson in a racist manner and commands him to comply with the request. Carson, draw some blood. Uh, doctor, according to his charts, he may be anemic. I don't think... Well, I don't care what you think, you do as I say. Don't think you're special, Carson, simply because there's no one like you in this department. You don't change your attitude, I'll get you kicked out of neurosurgery faster than you say yes, sir. His first emergency case as a resident doctor involves a patient who needs surgery right away. It's a matter of life and death situation. There isn't a doctor available to care for the patient, yet the resident Dr. Carson is ineligible to do surgery on a patient who is near death because he lacks a license. But he performs surgery and saves the patient, jeopardizing his entire career of which he had always dreamed. His superior calls him in his office. He fears that he would receive criticism for what he did, but to his surprise, the senior doctor recognizes his efforts to preserve the patient's life. His hospital duty and business both continue in this manner. A young couple brings their daughter who is having seizures to the hospital. She stays up all the time. She is half retarded according to the other doctors. She requires a hemispherectomy, which would remove a seizure-prone portion of the brain, according to Dr. Carson. 
This is extremely dangerous since the infant could become paralyzed or lose her capacity to speak and move. He informs the parent that although it is a risk, the child's brain has a remarkable capacity to replace defective cells with healthy ones and restore neurological functions. Additionally, he had never performed an operation of this kind before, but he accepts the challenge of curing the youngster. The evening before the procedure, he exudes anxiety. In the morning, he begins operating on the youngster after kneeling and praying. He handles the child with extreme care. The procedure is now complete. The time for judgment has come. The anesthesiologist tries to awaken the child's consciousness. Everyone is quite anxious. For every second, she stays silent. The scenario becomes more stressful. She relocates to the main ward. Dr. Carson informs the parents that it would take some time to determine whether she could speak properly, but somehow, the child calls out to her parents. Dr. Carson triumphs in the first of many tests and as a result of this occurrence the media shows a lot of interest in Dr. Carson. Alongside him at the news conference were her parents. He broadcasts to the entire world the progress and well-being of his patient. The brain, he claims, is a marvelous organ that made it feasible, and this hemispherectomy would later become the preferred treatment option in the majority of instances. He begins to experience career success, but his personal life is not as pleasant now as his wife is expecting. The horrific event then takes place, they lose their stillborn child, he spends time with his wife and visits her at her bedside, but she advises him to go to the hospital and carry out his duties. He goes, albeit reluctantly, when he considers his awful loss, he sobs, his mother comforts him by telling him that he may save countless lives and fulfill his life's goals. He shows up at his office as normal the following morning, his operation's hardest part is still to come, the issue of separating twins with conjoined heads is as complex as they come, therefore he traveled to Germany on invitation to serve as a consultant. Initially, he was reluctant to accept the case due to its complexity. However, he is the world's top pediatric neurosurgeon, he accepts the risk, conducts extensive research throughout the day and night, and gets ready for the procedure. Dr. Carson and 50 staff members prepare for the operation as the parents of the children arrive from Germany on D-Day, September 5, 1987. At 7.15 am the team starts their groundbreaking procedure to separate the conjoined twins, Dr. Carson has only one hour to finish, if he takes longer, there is a danger that they would be brain dead, making this a first failure, after a terrifying 21 hours, Dr. Carson succeeds in saving both children and tells their overwhelmed parents the good news. While he is admired by all, Dr. Carson thanks his mother and wife for having faith in him and tells the media about his accomplishments. The epilogue indicates that the twins lived and relocated to Germany, and are still there now. Dr. Carson continued to successfully operate on conjoined twins in a variety of different procedures, and it is because of his innovative work that hemispherectomy is now a commonly used treatment for seizures. In addition to his successful medical profession, Candy launched the Carson Scholarship Fund to honor outstanding students for academic performance. This concludes this recap. Please subscribe for more like this and hit the like to help the channel. Thanks for watching.